Halloween 2020, and I have a special presentation for you today. This is Tom Voigt from the website ZodiacKiller.com. I've had a website about the Zodiac case since 1998, and I've been doing Zodiac research since 1995, so it's been about 25 years. It seems like it's taken that long to get this presentation together. This is really important uh, for me to get out there because I think I have for you some unexplored territory uh, as far as the Zodiac is concerned. So I call this episode From Your Secret Pal, Melvin Belli and the Solution to the Zodiac Killer's Halloween Card. So I'm not approaching the Halloween card as if it's a cipher or some kind of a puzzle that you can solve and it gives you the Zodiac's name or something like that. I think the Halloween card has just captivated people for a very long time. And there are some components to it that people have speculated about, such as Zodiac adding this pumpkin to the card. What does it mean, if anything? But this presentation really is an explanation, I think, of the components that Zodiac did add, but more so, it's about Melvin Belli, because there are some pretty obvious hints, I believe, in the Zodiac's writings and the dates that he chose to, to mail them. I think it points to Zodiac being a very big uh, fan of Melvin Belli. Belli, of course, was a world-famous attorney at the time that Zodiac chose to write to him. He was a big star. He was a television star. He was a successful attorney, he was a millionaire, lived and worked in San Francisco, practiced law, had a law firm on Montgomery Street near the financial district in San Francisco, and actually worked, he lived as well on Montgomery Street, several blocks away, uh, had written many books, was frequently on talk shows and uh, in feature magazines. Belli was a big star. He was very charismatic, he was a showman, and he was someone who he did a lot more than he needed to to help people, people of all types. So he was well loved and definitely San Francisco's most famous resident. And at the time Zodiac chose to write to him, Zodiac was at his peak of notoriety. Receiving a letter from the Zodiac killer in late 1969 was the equivalent of finding the golden ticket to get in the chocolate factory. Whether you're a newspaper or a private citizen, getting a Zodiac letter was gold. And usually Zodiac wrote to the San Francisco Chronicle or other newspapers. But he chose to write to Melvin Belli. And I think this is really significant because the date, December 20th, 1969, is the exact one year anniversary of the Zodiac's beginning, really. The Lake Herman Road murders, December 20th, 1968. Zodiac killed Betty Lou Jensen and David Faraday, and exactly one year later, decided to mail a letter to Melvin Belli. This wasn't a threat to Belli. This wasn't trying to scare Belli. This was a reward. Bringing Belli into it, Zodiac intentionally bringing Melvin Belli into his story on a significant one year anniversary. And portraying in the letter, Melvin Belli being a very important man. I mean, this is, this is like fan mail. Help me. You can, you know, nobody can help me except you. You're such an important man. You know, I'm reaching out to you. And uh, this is like, this is like a love letter. There's nothing demeaning about it. There's nothing taunting about it. There's nothing threatening about it. It's very much different than all of the other Zodiac letters before or subsequent to this. Melvin is the only one who can help the situation. Well, there's a lot more to it than that. It wasn't just a letter to Melvin Belli. It was very personal. This is Belli's mansion. And Zodiac added a personal touch to the, to the letter. I wish I, I wish this was my discovery. This is Project MK Zodiac. Ricardo is the one who noticed this. Here's the envelope to the Belli letter. Look at the numbers as Zodiac drew them on the envelope. 
compared to the house numbers outside of Belli's mansion, it's the same. Zodiac actually copied the font style. That's a personal touch. At the time Zodiac wrote this letter to Belli, it's just a few months after Belli made his TV acting debut on NBC. Belli was already a big star, but after making his television debut as an actor, he was an even bigger star, and I'm sure he was accustomed to having fans outside of his mansion. Clearly, Zodiac was one of them. Now, his mansion was up on a hill. Montgomery Street kind of ends right here. And then there are stairs, there are benches. I think Zodiac was probably somebody who, on at least one occasion, was outside of Belli's mansion. Kind of like the people in Beverly Hills who go on those tours to see the movie stars' houses. The lower part of this eight is larger than the upper part. <laughs> this is just, I don't know if it's flattering or creepy. Um, but that's a, that's kind of something personal that Zodiac added and he didn't need to, he didn't need to do any of this. Writing to Belli, bringing Belli into his life on a significant one year anniversary of something important to Zodiac that was a big deal to Zodiac. And then on the one year anniversary, bringing Belli into it in a flattering way and making it personal. Okay, so this is a this tells me that Melvin Belli was a big part of what Zodiac was doing. And here's where it starts to get really nutty is that I started looking for could there be if if Zodiac which he did, he chose to bring Melvin Belli into his life on a significant one year anniversary to Zodiac. Could there be a significant event in Belli's life where Zodiac would choose to make that same connection? And I found that Belli's acting debut was in an episode of Star Trek on NBC, October 11th, 1968, exactly one year prior to the Zodiac killing Paul Stein. This television debut was a huge deal for Melvin Belli, who craved attention and, and publicity. And Zodiac decided on the one-year anniversary of such a big event for Melvin Belli that Zodiac would involve himself. And the episode of Star Trek was called And the Children Shall Lead. And this is important because this was an episode of Star Trek that had a heavy theme of children. This is Melvin Belli's own son, Melvin, uh, Melvin Caesar, who played Steve in this episode. The theme of children is important as it relates to the Paul Stein murder. So Bones and Kirk and Spock beam down to this planet. The adults are all dead. The kids are all acting weird and dressed like I don't know what. So they take the kids, beam back up to the Enterprise. And it turns out the kids have weird powers. This kid can put a spell on William Shatner and make him overact. It's a powerful spell because it's still working today. And it turns out the kids are influenced by this cult leader, Gorgon, who's played by Melvin Belli. He was great in this, and I have this exact shower curtain, by the way. A heavy theme of children. And there's a really interesting scene where Kirk realizes that even though he doesn't want to, he may have to kill the children. And that's really kind of a similar tone to Belli's letter that he received, where Zodiac's saying, I'll lose control. I, don't, I want to keep it in check. I don't want to kill the kids but you're the only one who can help me and I may lose control and kill him anyway, but it's not something I want to do. That's kind of like the theme of this letter to Melvin Belli. And that's really this, what Captain Kirk was dealing with is that he may have to kill these kids, even though he doesn't want to. So on the one year anniversary of this big event in Melvin Belli's life, 
And remember, Zodiac brought Belli into his life on a significant one-year anniversary to Zodiac. And it appears this is happening again because exactly one year after the Star Trek episode, the Zodiac killing Paul Stein, wanting it to be apparently at Washington and Maple, which is where he originally had Paul Stein go, Washington and Maple. This is where the children's theme begins. It is a children's crosswalk for this elementary school right here, Presidio Hill. School for children, it's been there for 100 years. Here it is right here. And even though the actual murder took place a full block west, not Washington and Maple, but Washington and Cherry, when Zodiac took credit for the Stein murder, he not only continued the children's theme by referring to the crime scene as Washington and Maple, it was a full block west, Washington and Cherry. But this is the location that Zodiac wanted associated with that murder because this keeps the children theme going. And it continues here. Not just children, but shall. What was the episode title? And the children shall lead. And here we have Zodiac using two of those words and continuing the theme of children. He could have called them kitties, like he did down here. He could have used the term, the word will. School kitties make nice targets. I think I will wipe out a school bus. No, he incorporated a couple words that were in the episode title. And the children shall lead, which was exactly one year prior to the Paul Stein murder. That's a subtle nod to Melvin Belli, just like we have the subtle nod to Melvin Belli copying the font, bringing Belli in, one year anniversaries. It's a pretty, to me, now it's very noticeable what Zodiac's doing. And this isn't, again, threatening Belli or trying to intimidate him or taunt him. This is, this is all flattering stuff. I, Zodiac seemed to have some connection to Belli. And it wasn't the only time that Zodiac did something creepy like that by getting personal with someone he was writing to. 1974, the Count Marco letter. Count Marco Spinelli was a columnist. And Zodiac wrote this letter right here, referencing Count Marco. And he did something weird that he'd never done. And it, I had to search for years to figure out how he did this, why he did it. These horizontal lines. Zodiac had never done that before. And I knew there had to be a reason for it. And I finally found Count Marco, a sample of his writing, answering a letter that somebody had written him, someone named Evelyn or something. Look what he does. The same horizontal lines. So here we have Zodiac in a letter referencing Count Marco, mimicking Count Marco, something distinctive that Zodiac noticed that Marco did. Zodiac copied it in writing, just like he did copying Melvin Belli in writing, the house numbers. I can't explain why he would do things like that, but it's creepy. I mean, it reminds me of that movie, The Thing, with Kurt Russell, where the thing would just become whatever it was going to become next, internalize it. Okay, so the Halloween card, I think, is continues the theme of Melvin Belli. As far as the pumpkin being added, I don't think there's really anything to it. Zodiac was dressing up this Halloween card because it was an important Halloween card to him. He's sending it to Paul Avery, who wrote most of the articles about Zodiac for the Chronicle. You see examples of, you know, these vintage decorations and Halloween cards where it's not really unusual to have a pumpkin placed in front of a skeleton. It doesn't have to mean sexual or whatever, but amateur psychiatrists for decades have been trying to figure it out. I think it's just Zodiac adding decoration to a Halloween card. 
Now, as far as adding these eyes, Zodiac added all of these eyes on here. If you're familiar with Secret Pal cards or vintage Halloween cards of all kinds, it doesn't have to be the Secret Pal kind of brand. Here's a vintage Secret Pal Halloween card and a common feature that you can find is all these eyes, these spooky eyes here uh, that are part of the card. I think Zodiac was simply adding decoration and this was something he was familiar with having seen Secret Pal cards before, adding the eyes to it. I think it's probably that simple. As far as this symbol right here with the four dots, I think the four dots are meant to represent the four sets of victims that Zodiac had. Faraday Jensen, Farron Majot, Shepard Hartnell, and Paul Stein. And I think this is to represent uh, a nearby landmark in the Bay Area, Mount Diablo, Devil Mountain. And of course, the devil is a theme for a Halloween card. Look at this general outline and compare it to Mount Diablo, which I'm going to pull up right here. Where is it? Oh, here we go. So this perspective is about... I'd say, what, 500 yards up in the air. It's the, the Lake Herman Road crime scene would be like right about here, I guess. And as you can see, the that shape, Mount Diablo. Even that extra little ridge right there. Now I'll pull up the extra little ridge. And the card is represented right here. But you can see that shape really is a fair representation of the outline of Mount Diablo. And if you're at the Lake Herman Road crime scene, it's very prominent in the background. There's that extra little line. And I'll show you as it would look like from a different perspective, Mount Diablo, Devil Mountain, perfect Halloween theme. Here we go. This is Mare Island. This is Vallejo. This is the crime scene at Lake Herman. And here you can see Mount Diablo. There's that shape again. And I really kind of think that Zodiac just included some of these spookier elements uh, to the card, not as some kind of a clue to his identity, but he's just decorating the Halloween card with extra flair. Now, what about the skeleton hanging here? It's, this is something Zodiac added as well. Skeletons hanging from the spider web. This is where it gets back to Melvin Belli. It's Melvin Belli with his skeleton Elmer, full-size human skeleton. You can see it's hanging here. It's always hanging. And what Belli would do is he used Elmer to demonstrate to the juries how his client had been injured. So if you were grocery shopping and you slipped and the store was negligent and you hired Melvin Belli to win you some money, Belli would go in front of the jury and he'd show, he'd position Elmer in different weird ways to demonstrate your injuries. Belli's nickname was the King of Torts. A tort is a payout you receive when you win. And that's what Belli was known for being awesome at, was winning you lots of money. And in part because of Elmer. Uh, when Elmer is not in court, you can go walk down Montgomery Street at any given time back then and look in the big windows of Belli's office. And Elmer would be hanging there on a hook next to Belli's desk. Belli, this is from a feature magazine, national magazine story about Melvin Belli. If you knew Melvin Belli, then you knew of Elmer. It's that simple. And you didn't even need to walk past Melvin's office to see Elmer. You didn't need to, to be a jury member to know of Elmer. You didn't need to. Uh, read the magazine articles to know of Elmer. And the reason is because Belli was such a showman and so flamboyant <clears throat> that he would actually drive around San Francisco in his convertible and have Elmer with him in the passenger seat. And so when you see when you see all of that, then and, and in keeping with the Melvin Belli theme that I think is pretty pretty obvious now, uh, this is Elmer. This is just another example of the Zodiac uh, putting a little subtle nod in his communications 
uh, that are directed to Melvin. I don't know if Zodiac thought that Melvin recognized all this. I don't think he did. I don't think Melvin did recognize these things. But I think it was important to Zodiac to keep these, these nods to Melvin Belli. And I think the Star Trek one with the theme of the children and the Paul Stein murder and the, and the whole, you know, the similarities between what was happening in the, in the Star Trek episode, the date, the theme of children. And then you have, I meant to pull this up. I'm losing my voice, I think. Then you have, maybe it's a coincidence, but having shall and children and the children shall lead. Uh, wow. I don't know. I, I think, uh, you know, comment down below. <clears throat> Excuse me. Comment down below if you think uh, this is far-fetched or uh, or or not. If you don't think it's far fetched, I definitely want you to comment down below. But I think the I think now that you you look at Helmer and his skeleton, Bella and his skeleton. Um, you, how could you not know about Elmer? Especially if you're in the Bay Area semi often as Zodiac apparently was, and with with the notoriety and he's always on the news, driving around California. Here you can see. I think is that the hook. I don't know what that is. How could you not know about Elmer? And ever since I learned about Elmer, every time I see the secret pal card, I just like that. That's Elmer. That's supposed to be Elmer. That's why Zodiac added that as a nod to Melvin Belli. That's what I think, at least. If you like this video, give me a give me a like. And if you like this overall content, I have a lot more stuff coming in the month of November. Then subscribe to my channel, and I will. Make sure that you get notified, thanks to YouTube, when I add new content. And again, go ahead and comment down below. I'll just delete the nasty ones. And what, did I cover everything? Before I let you go, I want to make sure that I covered everything. I think I did. This, this one really bothers me. The Count Marco and those lines. I saw those lines long ago when I first read the Red Phantom letter, and I was like, this, that, those things mean something. Zodiac didn't just do this for no reason. And it took about 15 years, and I finally found the Count Marco writing. And sure enough, Zodiac had copied him. Maybe wrote Mal Marco a fan letter, and Marco replied, and Zodiac spotted the horizontal lines and decided that he would copy it or maybe zodiac was somebody in count marco's kind of inner circle which would potentially reduce the pool of suspects tremendously i don't know but it's creepy fitting for halloween so thanks for listening and i'll make sure to put more content out there in november uh and beyond